welcome to The Green Urbanist, the podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Today's episode is a conversation with Glenn Howells Architects. I speak to Will Poole, who's a partner, Jack Pritchard, Associate Urban Designer, and Sophia Seneda, Architect and Sustainability Lead at Glen Hells Architects. They are based in London and Birmingham, and they've designed award-winning housing, tall buildings, and master plans across the UK. Our conversation focuses on how, over the last few years, they've shifted their approach towards sustainable design and developed their own studio culture and internal processes for delivering sustainable projects. If you're interested in how to embed sustainability within a design practice, you'll definitely get a lot of insights from this conversation. We also talk about the challenges of designing sustainable tall buildings and some of their thoughts on designing for climate adaptation. Really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Do you want to just introduce yourselves for the listeners? I'll start with you, Will. Yeah, hi Ross. Thank you for thank you for visiting us as well. Um, I'm William Poole. I'm partner in the London office of uh, Glen House Architects. I've been with the practice for 15 years and uh, primarily overseeing uh, residential-led development, and uh, in particular, quite a lot of master plans that are sort of multi-plot and several years in the in the delivery. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, Jack uh, Pritchard, uh, associate urban designer at Glen House Architects. Uh, trained as a urban design and with a planning background as, as well. Yeah, I'm Sophia. I've been at Glen Howards for eight years now and uh, I'm an architect uh, trained uh, uh, with actually environment studies uh, as part of my part two. So I have, you know, passionate approach to design sustainable buildings. Um, and yeah, I'm sustainability lead uh, for Glen Howards Architects and I'm based in the London office. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, do you want to get started talking a little bit about your uh, internal approach to sustainability? How are you sort of trying to integrate that into all your projects now? Yeah, I guess um, in in some ways we've regard us would always have regarded ourselves as a, as a practice who thinks about this at first principles in our design process anyway. But I think um, in the last uh, certainly two or three years that uh, has has very much hardened in the industry as something that needs to be uh, demonstrated uh, to ourselves as something that's tangible and and we you know can stand up to the scrutiny uh, of our own internal design process and all of the targets that we're now subscribed to. Um, so uh, we've, we've got um, two, I guess, ways of controlling and measuring uh, how we design and how we design sustainably. One of them is a design, uh, kind of a design philosophy. It's an acronym called CLEAN, uh, which um, Glenn de- devised uh, a few years ago, um, really with the intent of uh, making all of our staff aware of the, of the guiding principles of design. And obviously, like, like uh, probably many other practices would say, we don't have a house style, it's an approach and it's a philosophy. So um, that acronym stands for crafted, lean, elegant, appropriate and narrative. Uh, and those are the five things that we generally judge our design progress by. Um, uh, we often say that narrative uh, is the most important, um, but obviously the, the L for lean um, is, uh, is the sustainable part where we do the most with the least material and resources. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. So it's sort of a, it's almost like a, a, a minimalism approach rather than adding on lots of tech to make it sustainable. It's sort of saying, what can we take out to, to keep it lean? I like that. Yeah. That's right. So uh, ideally, you know, everything has a, at least one purpose and <laughs> ideally more than one uh, in a building. And, and I guess a lot of that comes from the structural rigor of the buildings. Um, generally, uh, quite quite rational buildings that um, obviously the, the structure is a guiding principle uh, for how the building ultimately performs and is programmed and how it looks. Um, so yeah, we, we do spend a, a lot of time focusing on that to uh, make sure that the buildings are a sort of lean uh, product of that of that process. Maybe if, if I go over to you, Sophia, can you tell us a little bit about what your maybe your role is and, and how you're trying to um, in, embed sustainability? In, in the process? Yeah, so we started about four years ago, in fact, uh, looking at, uh, you know, obviously, uh, net zero carbon was starting to almost uh, be, uh, in, you know, part of the UK uh, obligations. And we, we started to think about a roadmap, what we needed to do, and how we could embed a sustainable design more consistently, more coherently, measure it, you know, look at benchmark, 
um, and share knowledge also within the practice, the two practices, the two offices. You know, there's a lot of knowledge and good knowledge, uh, but not necessarily. You know, we didn't necessarily have that uh, shared knowledge across both practices. So looking at all these elements, we started in 2018, 2019. Uh, starting to be more specific about pr principles and targets. Um, and I happened to join uh, ACAN, the Architects Climate Action Network, uh, very early on in October in 2019, and also discovered uh, the work of Letty, the London e uh, Energy Transformation Initiative. So put, I put together, started to put together what I call this uh, sustainable design checklist, which look at, you know, uh, starting by, which in effect embraced very much the principle that Letty has, uh, you know, published in their in their works, amazing work by the way. Um, but it's very much that part of it is obviously historical from uh, the GHS perspective in terms of uh, using less material, uh, try to reuse existing, uh, using with passive principle in mind for services and for in terms of form orientation. Um, and uh, you also with efficient services in mind, working closely with you know the MEP for uh, having the best solutions that uh, and produce the most efficient buildings. So yeah, we we've been on a journey, um, and uh, gradually we started to look at our project. So these sustainable design checklists allow us to look at uh, you know in general how how well do you apply these principles, and allows us to kind of benchmark our own projects. You know. Um, so we did a few like this, and then uh, uh, some uh, open source tools have emerged, uh, like the Mesh Energy tool for carbon calculation, the Fid Fidland Clare and Bradley Studio tool uh, for carbon calculation, and we look at all these tools and you know checked what was best for us to use within the culture of the organization, because I think that's quite important as well. Obviously, measuring carbon emission 10 years ago was hardly spoken about. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden it emerged, but not everybody is that way minded in terms of when you work in a design practice. So we wanted to find the best way uh, to make sure that the studio would work uh, towards this, uh, this assessment. And uh, we nominated uh, some studio champions and um, you know, sometimes they were great at it and uh, we, we got some results. And all of this allowed us really to look at project and to just decide and to see uh, decide about the, or design uh, options and decision and see you know what was uh, not so low carbon about it and what was low carbon and I, I kind of always thought about it as low carbon design not really net zero carbon uh, because I think we can help deliver low carbon design building in terms of a net zero carbon process is, is, is an add-on which is not necessarily within our remit so you know, that's so, yeah, that, and we're still on a journey to be honest with you. And obviously, knowledge sharing. And now, I think the one of the main things is, uh, you know, um, we can, circular economy obviously is the way forward. There's no, there's no other way, uh, reducing demand for resources. So, um, it's, it's about having uh, making the demand for it, but also, you know, we're relying on other processes to happen within the cities, for instance for, you know, database of material available, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, you know, keeping abreast of all these developments to make sure that we've got, we can tap on, on the best resources to, to move our, our design forward. So it's, it's an enormously complicated subject that Sophia has helped us to grapple with as an organisation. I guess what the brief we set to her, which is what we have uh, now up and running across the practice, is that we're able fairly simply and, and for uh, all of the staff to engage with this uh, checklist and toolkit, we're able to test all of our early stage projects uh, and generate um, a kind of score, which is based not just around carbon, that's part of it, but also about uh, transport, well-being, community, uh, and, and the wider environment, um, as well as the building fabric. Um, so by having that score, we're able to tweak and adjust things through dialogue with client brief about their brief and, and with engineers and, and show tangible improvements mm -hmm. through that before the, lots of these principles get locked into a planning design. Yeah. yeah, I think this is something that also very early on we tried to make everybody aware of is that it was very important and very critical to engage with a client from the onset, from stage zero, make sure there was a client brief that, you know, looked at uh, principle and targets and also the key the key actors in the in the project, the key 
uh, consultants. So making sure, yeah, that everybody, because obviously the you know the opportunity is to uh, you know for reducing. Uh, carbon emission in particular, you know, drop dramatically as you go forward in, in the project. So if you start to look at it at stage three, you already lost mm -hmm. quite a great amount of uh, possibilities. So uh, our, our best project was when the client was very forward about it, and we, we do have some uh, good clients in that respect. Um, and when we had also the construction team, you know, as part of these early stages, it was quite important in terms of looking at a sustainable procurement plan and, you know, what can be do, done with existing assets, for instance. So we had one project where we had, you know, historical steel on site, you know, and at least it was considered, uh, you know, at the time, you know, whether or not the, the steel could be reused. Obviously, we need to be retested, certified, and, you know, make good, etc. But, you know, all this discussion is really important. So it was important also that everybody was aware of that, that this is not something you, you know, you leave for the later stage in design, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, not, not something you leave just for one person to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely not, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we've seen change dramatically in the last three years, really, is that it's not just uh, us or the design team pushing, uh, but we're being held to account, the whole industry is holding each other mm. to account for, uh, for doing better. And that's, um, it's, it's obviously the local authorities and it's policy changing as well, but it's most definitely uh, our clients and their funders as well behind them. Yeah. So it's, it's really changed things around and it's great that everybody's sort of finally uh, pulling in the same direction. Did 2019 seem like a turning point for accelerating this stuff? Probably 2020, I would say, uh, is the year where things started to accelerate. But they are larger clients I know have developed, you know, uh, their client brief and uh, in terms of sustainability, in terms of the way we look at sustainability today, already uh, a few years before. So, yeah, probably, in, I don't know why you suggest 2019 in particular, but 2020 seems to be the year where there were lots of work publication and also consultation with the government, you know, the, the consultation going on about the future home standard and the power L, you know, all happened in that period. So uh, I think, yeah, there was a momentum there, certainly also with Letty's work where they published their, their climate emergency primer and, uh, and the other guidance all around, you know, how to reduce embodied carbon. So, um, yeah. I wonder, to, to sort of bring this to life, I suppose, for people listening, can you tell us a little bit about some, some of your projects and how you've applied this and, and a little bit about that? And buildings as well as sort of larger urban scale stuff. So um, part of the work that um, Sophia's doing with the project testing has obviously included uh, some of our legacy projects, if you like, uh, uh, designs that were committed several years before 2019, 2020, um, which can show us uh, where we're starting from in order that we can demonstrate an improvement on that. Um, those have included one that's very recently completed in Canary Wharf called Wardian, which is a, a very high density uh, pair of towers of 50 and 55 stories of apartments. Um, now that design was conceived in around 2012, so it's, a, it's been a 10 year process to have that built. Um, and it's been interesting for us to see uh, both in terms of the structure, fabric, embodied carbon content, but also the wider implications of that kind of development on, on sustainable uh, living. And that's a good example where you're within two or three minutes walk, walk of, uh, of Jubilee Line and other transport uh, networks. Uh, and it's somewhere that's increasingly regarded as a mixed-use neighbourhood. It's no longer the financial district uh, that, it, that it was originally. Um, and so there's great, great many benefits that go with building high and building very dense there, which include you know, uh, virtually no reliance on car ownership, uh, less burden on the transport network, benefits to the local economy, and all of those things. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you're seeing that increasingly become part of the narrative, isn't it? And that's probably one of the harder things to start to benchmark is that, you know, there are some real positives of tall buildings and high density and that energy dimension of, of cities, and you can compare the, the sprawl of America and the amount of gasoline that city is like Atlanta used versus, you know, New York, and this, this maybe slightly jarring narrative or vision that n the idea of New York being, you know, or any high-density city or tall city being the model of a green city, you know, it's, it's got that face of, you know, steel, glass, concrete, um, but as a, 
efficient use of resources obviously does particularly well. And I think that's part of the challenge is, is obviously how people go about living their day-to-day -day lives, maybe very sustainable for the will reasons that will referred to, but it's also then sort of reconciling that with the construction of, of tall buildings as well and the built fabric that goes with it. So um, I think we're seeing, we are seeing a, a, certainly a shift and, and, and more is continuing to happen, isn't it, across London since, since you know, the first iterations of the London plan and congestion charging came in and, and seeing more I think driven largely by GLA and and it's they you know they've they've continued to focus on 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 walking and cycling and healthy streets initiatives that have come forward are really really positive and now that's all integrated in in the London plan and you do those assessments as you as you as you go through the planning process. Um, but we're also seeing on on on, on some of our recent projects in, in Blackwall Yard in 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 uh, the south of Poplar um, in in Tower Hamlets as well. Uh, you know, a drive to, to think about how uh, uh, we can actually allow or enable people to make different choices and move away from cars, and, and, and that's not just by providing cycle parking, but different types of uh, 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 parking for, for non-standard cycles, mobility hubs, um, e-scooters, of course, are, are becoming more pre prevalent across the city as well. So thinking, you know, more dynamically about that and, and shared ownership and resources as well, going to back to Sophia's point about the circular economy, which has certainly become the buzzword. I think it's mentioned about 40 times in, in the London plan, and it was mentioned twice the previous iteration. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very much at the front and centre, isn't it, of... Uh, of uh, the, the idea, you know, the, 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 what needs to be at the heart of sustainability these days. And maybe this is a good time to talk about, I mean, recon reconciling some of those issues with, with tall buildings. Yeah, and I guess that there's a, a slightly harsh reality still that um, above a certain height, you're left with very few options in terms of structure and substructure for, for residential mm -hmm. buildings. So certainly all of the tall residential um, schemes that we're involved with are, are uh, reinforced concrete frame buildings, sometimes with um, post-tensioned slabs, which does take out some of the weight uh, in those. Um, but increasingly within that, we're starting to see a lot more recycled uh, aggregate and less um, cement content, which has a dramatic improvement on the amount of embodied carbon going into these buildings. We're starting to respond more to emerging policy in the London plan and other documents around uh, increasing dual aspects. So that's having a direct effect on layouts uh, and the kind of facade to wall, uh, sorry, the wall to floor ratios that are critical to keeping the buildings um, um, viable. So there's a, a balancing act to be made there, and that then feeds back into the structural arrangement. So we're work, working with engineers to see where we can tighten and reduce the spans of structural grids, which again takes volume and weight out of floor slabs and columns. So it's a case of um, doing the best within the uh, regulatory framework that we have. And obviously there's a lot of debate and discussion around uh, concrete uh, versus timber and um, we are seeing fortunately um, good improvement in other building typologies and other sectors and, and uh, I guess fundamentally lower structures where we're increasingly uh, using timber and, and hybrid timber and steel um, structures. So our, our hope is that we can continue to uh, realise the benefits of high density residential building and at some point introduce those technologies to make them uh, really uh, function in every sense sustainably. And, and when, when you, so to go back slightly, when you uh, looked at your past project with, with the, your sustainability checklist, did you learn anything from that process that has informed what you're designing now? The reality is that the bulk of the carbon footprint comes from the structure, and then uh, some of it will come from the services, obviously. We've been, you know, services and, you know, the need for reducing energy demand has been going on for one or over decades, certainly in terms of regular regulations. Uh, but so the bulk of it is uh, first to target the structure and the efficiency of a layout, as uh, as we'll just explain. Um, and, and then we can look at the other, uh, and we do have this constraint in this country, let's face it, compared to, you know, uh, the Scandinavia where we can build story, uh, you know, like 18-story building in timber, whether it's in France also where we have, you know, this obligation for public building to be 50% bio-based, uh, Canada, America, you know, you know, we have that regulatory constraint, we 
cannot get away from it now. The investors won't get, you know, won't want to, to put their fingers in it at this stage. Um, so what what it, I think what's happening is that we will be prepared certainly once we have a chance to you know to go and build in timber. Uh, we just don't have that opportunity at the moment. I think that's that's the thing. So I, I would say that, and then the facade. And now we, you know what's happening nowadays is that we have more and more. Uh, innovative material, also more and more traditional material, but maybe produced via renewables. So obviously, Im immediately that diminishes the carbon footprint. So even for you know brick facade, so all these elements put together, you know, help obviously dram dramatically reduce uh, our carbon footprint. So we look at it at all angles. To be honest, I think that's the way to do it. Every every little bit helps, literally. I think another big consideration for high density and tall buildings is the quality of public realm that they're providing and the, uh, the microclimate effects that tall buildings have on public realm at ground floor, which is obviously about uh, the public as much as it is the residents who, who get to live in these buildings. Um, there have been a lot of bad examples, I suppose, in the last 20 years, which, and particularly the last 10 years, where there's been a huge increase in the amount of tall buildings. Um, it's, it, it's peaking even now, the number of planning consents coming forward for buildings over 20 storeys and indeed up to 60, 70 storeys in some parts of London. So that's a really important consideration. It's one that um, uh, we spend a great deal of time with our uh, microclimate engineering teams and certainly in the uh, discussions in pre-application stages of our projects it is very much um, close to the top of the agenda. So um, we're very keen that public space that's provided adjacent and around these buildings uh, d does a good service to um, the, the public who are going to be enjoying those spaces, that they get um, good levels of daylight and sunlight and that they are not sort of over encumbered by strong winds. Um, so obviously we work with a broad team of um, uh, environmental uh, engineers and wind tunnel tests and all of these things to, to check that those spaces can be delivered in a, in a high quality way. And that also leads into an increasing tendency to make sure that we've got a, a sort of biophilic angle, to use that word, mm. uh, to the project. So um, I think everybody, the whole industry, recognises the value and the importance to well-being of having that uh, easy access to nature, which is partly about uh, greenery and soft landscape, but it's also about air quality and daylight and, and views. Um, so it's, it's very much part and parcel with high density that you're sort of giving back enough quality to the external spaces to, to compensate. Um, I'd love to move on a little bit. I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. But um, just to, I, I think this summer in the UK, we really felt that climate change is here. And we had the, you know, record breaking temperatures, heat waves that were very difficult to deal with, with our urban form and the urban infrastructure that we have. Um, is this now starting to play into your your design process and, and thinking about you know the, the new climate era that we're in? It certainly brings it home, doesn't it? You know, I mean, just you know, personally speaking, be able to open up both windows at the front and back of the house. You know, stand fairly standard Victorian terrace, but you know, open up the windows at the back at the front at night, get that cool breeze through. And I think that's one of the things that is starting to change in you know in, in policy as well. As there's going to be a slightly uh, uh, reinforcement perhaps of, of dual aspect and the shift towards the, the wording in policy is, is single aspect. Um, f homes are you know, no longer really acceptable unless you know, very clearly justified um, and, and that the need to really be uh, optimising the amount of dual aspect in, in it will mean that you know, the typical uh, you know, plan form of, of, of buildings, both both taller and, and medium scale, will, will continue to be kind of refined and reckon, need to be reconciled um, with their overall approach to form. And, and of course, that's going to have you know impacts on efficiency and other elements of the process as well. So, you know, having that, I think the dual aspect one is is, is clearly going to going to be, be is coming forward at the moment. And I think uh, you know, at the moment that's with the GLA to. to to, they're going through that process of, uh, you know, trying to understand and, and uh, provide that clarity, um, you know. And, and for us, it's it's critical that you know we start to see that soon because, as you say, you know, the, these these schemes kind of move at pace. We're working with a number of, of, of obviously fairly large schemes across London, um, and and these changes will have a big impact on the way that uh, the, the the schemes, uh, you know, come forward.
What's going to be interesting to see is that all of those shifts in policy, although they might appear quite subtle, they're going to have quite a dramatic impact on the typologies and, yeah. and the form and shape of buildings to come in the next five to ten years. So we're, you know, we're, we're sort of um, interested to be part of that journey and, and, and see how that sort of challenges us and our approach to design. But there's no doubt that um, the policy is heading very much in a direction that we support. And it's for the benefit of the, of the quality of the residents' uh, lives so who are going to uh, occupy those buildings. Yeah, I think overheating is obviously, I mean, as, as kind of uh, mentioned by Jack, the cross ventilation is quite important. Overheating for me is going to be the biggest change that people will experience. And certainly in some of the schemes that were, you know, up to now recently built, is going to be a big issue. Um, and, uh, you know, this policy you know, rightfully will make this, uh, you know, harder to... Even uh, one of our projects, for instance, we had uh, both uh, cross-ventilation and uh, adjacent ventilation, what we call adjacent ventilation, from, you know, uh, a facade at 90 degrees, and they wouldn't even... The climate... There was a climate officer on board, and uh, they were not particularly keen on, you know, on recognising that this was part of, uh, you know, the kind of ventilation, uh, the... The dual aspect, if you want, even though it's up to now has been recognized in uh, the GLA documentation. So overheating is something we're going to have to deal with in terms also because we want to allow the light, obviously, uh, but we need to have to find that sweet spot balance and uh, use more shading externally. It's, it's not culturally something that is prevalent in the UK, but obviously if you look at uh, Southern Europe, you know, um, the, this is Lots of colonnades. Well, you know, colonnades, Bologna, or, you know, or, uh, you know, external shutters. You know, these are all very simple devices, in fact, but uh, very efficient as well. So we have... And I think it extends then again back into the uh, sort of urban scale where you have this heat island effect within built up uh, areas which only exacerbates the problems within the, uh, within the homes, that, that within those areas. So again it's back to sort of how we treat landscape and how we uh, re-green our streets to, uh, and indeed use water and the evaporative cooling benefits that, that plants and water can bring to, to, to that. So uh, you know it, it's, it's empirically proven that uh, those sorts of um, benefits will, will sort of dramatically reduce the average temperatures yeah. uh, through the hotter periods and, and obviously that's something that we're pleased to see coming forward in a lot of um, boroughs in London and, and a lot of our projects uh, and it's key to the work that we're doing at the moment in Canary Wharf which is about sort of greening their water spaces so they already have uh, abundant uh, sort of uh, water uh, to gain that benefit from and to offset the, the I guess, the impacts of, of uh, a lot of um, heat generated from the hard surfaces and from the tall buildings uh, in that estate. It, it strikes me, just as you were saying, that we, you know, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel with this, but maybe looking to other parts of the world that have historically been warmer. And it strikes me that probably one of the possibly an effective way of giving people a lot of um, relief would be giving, say, permitted development rights for people to whack shutters on the outside of their buildings. And as you said, it's not culturally something we've done. But if we're in a climate emergency, you know, we need to think of fast ways of rolling this out and just learning from our neighbours might be a, a good starting point. Um, it happens very quickly, though, doesn't it? You know, with the year ago, Insulate Britain protesters getting arrested and you know public nuisance and, and, you know, how that narrative suddenly changes so quickly with, you know, the energy price cap discussion and the environment you know the environment at the moment it, the narrative just around things can change quite quickly and makes you think you know at some point in the sort of early to mid 20th century we we discovered technologies that could cool buildings even if they did get hot inside and i guess now we're moving from that era of high tech into one that's about low tech yeah. and it's building in passive design principles now that aren't going to rely on clever uh, machinery and and energy consuming machinery to keep them cool so we are very much looking back at buildings that are not all about maximising glass on the facade, but they're about very careful use and even judging how much glass to use on each orientation of the building uh, to, to get the right balance of, of daylight and, and, uh, and, and uh, preventing overheating. Um, and then a lot of our much bigger master planning projects that are on the books now 
might be over a 20 to 30 year um, time, time scale. So uh, it would be pointless almost to hang too much on the mechanical and uh, you know, the technological aspects of those designs. So mm. it's very much for us about designing in uh, sound principles that, as you say, are very time honored and looking back actually to the pre-modern era uh, to, to gain lessons in that. And learning from biomimicry, I suppose, is lots of astonishing example. And uh, I mean, I think uh, Janine Bailey, Bailey is, uh, I think, yeah, yeah, she's she's like an expert on it. But you know, this example of, for instance, the, Nab the Namibian uh, beetle that is able to capture through the carapace the shape of a carapace, you know, fog water just enough, you know, to keep moisture. The, you know, all these examples that, as she says have been in development for millions of years, everything is there. So I think, you know, vernacular and biomimicry, so new technology based on biomimicry, I think would be fantastic because these are, in nature, we have absolutely astonishing examples of how we can, you know, uh, use the natural resources to our benefits uh, without obviously undermining the environment and these natural resources in the first place, so, yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're also getting into the world of natural, sort of natural materials that are, are able to replace, hopefully, yeah. um, sort of uh, petroleum-based products, things like yeah. insulation mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. And they're not quite scaling up mm -hmm. <laughs> as fast as we might hope, but I hope there's some, uh, some possibility for more experimentation with that in the coming years. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I mean, uh, in the nature, for instance, they're going to launch a new line of insulation material in October, and they say at scale, so... You know, things are happening, uh, surely. Um, so, yeah, natural-based material, but also using waste material at the moment. There's lots of stuff we can recuperate. So, for instance, you have insulation made of jeans, which, you know, uh, has been used, uh, you know, as a pilot scheme in the waste house. But, um, you know, now it's been also produced at scale, you know. So, there's lots of examples. So you know, using the waste, what we consider to be waste so far, but now we should value. So mining, you know, our resources from existing stuff, as well as, you know, producing stuff from hemp, for instance, that, you know, grows very quickly, or bamboo, uh, stuff that grow really quickly. Uh, and so, you know, there's not such a, a threat on, 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 on these resources, basically, from our demand uh, for the building industry. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is maybe, you know, you are starting to see a shift in terms of where homes are being de uh, allocated around London um, and a shift towards more development to outer London, um, particularly as the political landscape shifts. Perhaps it becomes more easier to deliver homes in outer London, but we're certainly seeing that in some of our projects. This kind of, you know, challenging the suburban, the narrative of the suburbs in some way as well. Um, and reckon, rec like we're reconciling, you know, taller buildings with sustainability, it's, it's moving away from, you know, pretty, particularly in places that are well connected. Um, uh, there's many parts of, of, of out of London that have, you know, some of the highest ratings in terms of P town, yet remain very kind of car dependent um, with, you know, low rise shopping centres and space, any spaces that can be, can be optimized um uh and 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 the net, you know how that that interface end with density and the need to kind of optimize optimize as as london plan refers to it density in these sort of sites we know there's an emphasis on building taller and they're in, in, in well connected sites and you know next to train stations and um so you know i think that will be kind of you know over the next kind of 10 years i think it's the first time that, you know there's more housing allocated in outer london than in london over the time frame of that sort of london plan i think the other thing that we're going to see a lot more of of course is retention and adaptive reuse of existing structures so um it's now no longer the de default assumption that you'll go in and demolish what's there you'll actually uh, give give proper consideration to the potential uh, carbon uh, and energy savings of retaining structures so we are starting to see that uh, much more readily accepted by uh, by clients and developers and funders, but also challenging ourselves to find uh, clever ways of, of retaining um, buildings on site and not having to um, uh, put put an uh, extra burden on uh, waste waste streams coming out of these projects.
Um, I think also because we're operating in uh, the, the sort of workspace as well as the residential spheres, what's interesting is that you're starting to see the edges of those two uses uh, starting to blur somewhat and with the uh, work, working more sort of remote working or working from home happening and uh, equally the other way around, uh, workspaces increasingly needing to adapt to the demands of, of modern workers and, and, uh, and people who are starting their careers in work who have different expectations of what the workplace environment is like, um, which generally uh, is, is seeing a, a much stronger trend for uh, comfortable, more domestic t type spaces and, and amenity spaces in the workplace. Um, so I think that's, that's very much a sort of work in, in progress, and there's a huge disparity at the moment, certainly in our industry, of, of whether people are sort of five days a week in the office or, or, or one or two. Um, and obviously that we know there are all sorts of pros and cons to, to either side of that coin, um, but it's interesting to see how that's influencing both the residential uh, briefs that we're, that we're working on and the workspace ones. Uh, another way that um, buildings can uh, come to terms with a, a shortfall in land availability in, in dense urban areas such as we're working in, in London is to start to uh, adapt to water spaces and we've, we've just completed the, um, the, the water pavilions uh, out at Wood Wharf and Canary Wharf um, which are uh, sort of float, effectively floating uh, restaurant and, and retail structures uh, on the water so they're essentially a hollow concrete hull that was towed into place and, and, and constructed uh, fairly locally. Actually the water pavilion also all you can disassemble every every piece of uh, the structure that has gone into it, or the cladding that has gone into it. So, and the hull even itself can be then repurposed uh, at the end of its life. If it's not for that, it can be moved away somewhere else. So that's already an example. Uh, the material I went into it, probably a new material, but they can be completely reused. Uh, they have a life beyond the life of these uh, this, uh, two purposes at the moment. Uh, so it's great for us to get the chance to be involved with experimental projects like that that we learn a lot from and I guess that starts to point to potential lessons for the future in, in flood resilience as well, particularly you know, in, in, in East London and, and on both sides of the barrier yeah. um, for us to sort of learn and, and adapt these technologies uh, into the future, hopefully into different um, uses and, and perhaps even for housing at some point as well unless they do so well in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm.